ओके नमस्कार टू ऑल ऑफ यू फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल नमस्कार राह जी यू ओपन युअर ऑडियो नाउ इट्स ओके इट्स ओके वी आर स्टार्टिंग नाउ सो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू दिस एटीन सेशन ऑफ साउथ एशियन ऑनलाइन लिटरेरी कॉन्फ्रेंस being jointly organized by the sahit academy and the foundation of sark writers and literature we have four participants in this session who will be presenting their short stories each participant will be reading one story the names of the participants are mr anwar wafa from afghanistan dr vasanti from india mr rahad abir bangladesh and uh, mr ramendu majumdar he is also from bangladesh and uh, mr ramendu will also be chairing this session and since we have 45 minutes for this session i would request each participant to take around 10 minutes and please adhere to this time limit i also request all of you to introduce yourself before you make your presentation first of all i invite uh, since uh, mr anwar wafa is not there i think he must be joining in due course so let us invite dr vasanthi ji from india to make her presentation vasanthi ji thank you thank you so it gives me immense pleasure to meet you all in this forum for that vasanthi ji for the time being you can remove your mask i think no i can't i i am doing it with permission okay okay go ahead so during this pan- pandemic period to have such a thing okay okay possible not only because of technology but the untiring en- enthusiasm of ajit ko and also the sahitya academy to, to bring the writers Uh, together and to share their experiences i thank the sahitya academy and also the sark forum for inviting me i write in tamil one of the four languages of the south of south india and it is an ancient language i have been writing for more than 50 years you can call me also an ancient i write novels short stories and a number of books have been published and bagged some awards on the way i write in english also non fiction mainly and uh, write on tamil nadu politics five of my books have been published by penguin jagarnath alas and so on i shall now read a translation of my tamil story titled the testimony it is about a girl who has received a summons from the court to present her case of an incident during communal riots and the story is about um, the reaction of her uh, the news of her when the news of her summons spread in the story revolves around the about the reaction of her community and on hearing the news and also of the perpetrators of the crime and how the girl responds to the pressures now i go to the story the testimony mother was taking a long time to lock the door the girl stood mute and inert not attempting to ponder why the simple act would need so much time she opened her handbag and checked its contents once again the brown and yellow paper was there someone pulled her dupatta startled she turned her little brother chinna thambi was looking at her with panic eyes i do not feel like accompanying you akka both of you can go Why are you making such a fuss she asked slightly frustrated 
behave responsibly you are the only male in this house she said patting his bony little shoulder what is tumbi saying asked mother she lost her cool nothing it's getting late amma why on earth are you taking so long to lock the door i am not able to lock the door dear amma's fingers quivered she could not insert the key in the keyhole with her quaking hand give it to me i will lock the door the girl said taking the lock and key from her mother a few heads peeked out of houses nearby some neighbors emerged from their houses amma covered her head with her sari almost hiding her face the girl held chinatambi's chilled hand and stepped out an eerie silence seemed to smother the entire street stray dogs lifted their heads and looked down again without barking birds flew noiselessly even noise from vehicles seemed absent the fixed stares increased her apprehension her legs seemed to buckle under her she felt like touching her mother's saree and muttering i do not feel like accompanying you both of you can go amma it seemed like the whole street including the dog were frozen as they moved forward on weak legs she expected someone to come forward like in the movie and boost their morale by saying you need not go we will take care so you are off asked the lady next door in <clears throat> much the same tone as one might ask is the body ready for burial coming nearer she added they say you must speak cautiously the girl t- turned and spied the lady's husband at the window he felt buried in his glare which conveyed a thousand caution he had repeated the same word when he happened to see her without his wife's urging they say you must speak cautious she did not she need not ask who those were who said this she was familiar with every frozen person's voice in the street and the next they were the ones who had hailed her as a loving mate one of their own endearingly today they believed their faith rested on her testimony she felt unable to breathe when she felt their collective voices and fears crawl and climb rapidly onto her back even amma and chinna tambi joined them weighing her down she felt weary as if her back had broken for some reason mother hesitated and stood still amma get moving do not respond to anyone now amma followed her in silence chinnatambi walked with her gripping her hand tightly they saw the old man who lived in the house at the farthest end of the street he was sitting in front of the small corner shop and smoking a beedi it would be hard to avoid him she thought he had been visiting them every night for the past 10 days to pontificate including last night those who are gone or gone forever can we bring them back you should concern yourself with those who are alive he had said the girl wondered how he could talk to them that way sitting inside the smoke blackened wall amma sat in silence staring at the wall she then buried her head in her knee her back shook with her storm you will act with prudence if you consider the well-being of your neighbor relatives and dear one our community the the girl controlled the waves of emotion rising inside her because there was no need to respond to this old man 
what is the point of my standing here and talking if you don't respond? He asked. She erupted suddenly. Grandpa, what would you have done if you had experienced what we have gone through? What would be your thinking? Would you have let bygones be bygones? She was mildly shocked as he faced this question from a young girl, her eyes wide and chest heaving. He shook his head repeatedly as fear gripped the pit of his stomach. He trembled. He left the house in silence. He said something almost under his breath as he was leaving. She remembered the panic, helplessness, and anger in his eyes. Your quest for justice might endanger all of us. It might endanger those left of your family. He took courage in her silence and continued. If you point out the ones who did it, will their hands be plucking, plucking flowers? Grandpa, please leave. Leave, he shouted when the silly old man opened his mouth again. She spat on the ground in disgust and cussed him for a long time after he left. She buried her head in Amma's lap and cried hard when she remembered the helplessness and fear in his eyes. She could almost see the ash-white look of fear in Grandpa's eyes. There was panic coupled with fear. She now walked with her head bowed. She was afraid that he would attempt to talk to her. It was easy to be unmoved and controlled. Weakness engulfed her as she walked along the street. She felt she could trip on a blade of grass. Citing any police person brought on panic attacks. Her tongue had refused to cooperate when they, when they had questioned her. She had no idea what going to the court entailed. She had never stepped into one before. She had no clue about who would defend her. She could not understand when the lady next door asked, won't you have a government lawyer to defend you? Please take care of the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It will be over now. She, she had received an inscrutable and strange glance in response. You're a young girl. What can you do alone? She had felt angry. Ask your husband to accompany me. Her neighbor stopped talking after that. She sent someone walking with her and turned. The old man spoke quickly as if afraid she would escape him. It seems that Rascal has some big plan. The police and government are on his side. Think well and make a decision. He went back and sat on the bench without waiting for her. Response. She was unable to contain the waves of resentment rising within her. She walked on breathing heavily. Yoti ji, control the time, control the time. Vasanti ji. Oldie can only talk like that. Amma walked on, afraid to even respond. Even Chin Chinatambi had been unable to eat that day. They had just had a drunk a cup of tea and that was all. She became alert. When Chinnathambi tightened his grip on her hand and slowly turned. Somebody was following her. Ten or fifteen people. Her tongue had curled into itself. Why am I afraid when I should be angry? She questioned herself. The crowd followed, heckling them. Her legs felt like rubber even before they reached the court. Her heart, her heart felt heavy with the sound of an axe resonating with them. 
she realized that amma and chinna thambi had frozen for an entirely different different reason kishori lal stood before her he seemed to tower over her covering heaven and earth she felt her hatred well within her and searched for the appropriate words to abuse him in well kishori lal looked at amma and chinna thambi with narrow eyes pray that at least these two will live he told her there were numerous black coats covering in front of the court the summons said she had to present herself in the court at 11 am a black coat approached her and said come on come on they are waiting for you amma and chinna thambi were asked to stand aside the court was overflowing she searched for relatives or acquaintances among the crowd there were none who is the government lawyer she asked hesitantly that's me said the black coat standing beside her she wondered how this lawyer who had not even spoken to her until then could possibly defend her the lawyer stared at something distant when she asked him will our case win she felt angry why will we not get justice the lawyer came close and spoke in her ear what can we do the police and establishment are on their side vasant ji i would request you to stop here please look no, at her Yeah, just, because the, there are two more speakers, and we have another uh, uh, twelve waiting. Yeah. Don't you want to know the end? Yes, yes, please. So I'm coming to the end. So the judge asks her. The trial commenced, and uh, all the witnesses who were there during the incident all say they were not there at all. They did not witness it. so she the judge sits and asks her they asked for her name where she lived her father's name her mother's name the names of the living and the list of the dead total number dead 14 her tongue twisted when she uttered their name was 14 improbable it was a joint family she looked at the judge in confusion she thought kishori lal was sitting in the judge's chair did you witness the incident the incident she felt dizzy just thinking about it just 3 minutes more please <laughs> <laughs> madam we have two no. more speakers no, no, not just... more than 10 minutes okay, okay. i she beg has... your pardon okay i don't want to you don't want to know the end ajit just a minute now this what does a girl say that is enough enough for santi enough okay i think we can go to the next speaker okay okay so so uh, i really uh, apologize to you vasanti ji because of the squeeze of the time now we request mr mr rahad abir for, from bangladesh with a request to uh, comply with the time limit uh good afternoon everyone uh my name is rahad abir uh i'm from bangladesh currently i live in new hampshire usa um a few words about my writing my work has appeared in the los angeles review singapore unbound uh, uh himal south asian courier international the where and elsewhere um i have an mfa in fiction from boston university i received the 2017-18 charles peak fellowship at the university of east anglia at present i'm uh, working on a short story collection which was a finalist for the 2021 miami book fair emerging writer uh, fellowship um i'm going to read a, a few pages from my story excuse me <coughs> i have cold um i'm going to read a few pages from my story do not uh, look at girls uh, it's a coming of age story uh, it's a story about a muslim boy growing up in a religious family in bangladesh uh the story was uh, published in the los angeles review uh, which was uh, which which recently has been nominated for 
uh, best of the net uh, 2021 uh, by the journal. Uh, so here is my story. Do not look at girls. Do not look at girls. Your dad warns you at the beginning of your teenage years. The first accidental glance is okay, he says. The second is sin. Your dad, a large man, powerful eyes, solemn face. When talking to him, you never look him in the eye, never waste a word. Nothing but the most necessary talk is ever shared. He runs a grocery store, works long hours. He has little time for family or himself either. Sometimes you help him on the weekends. During the fall of your uh, 12th birthday, your dad becomes tough. This dunya dari, he says, this life is nothing but short-lived drops of water on a tarot leaf. We humans are Ashraful Maklukat, the best creation of Allah. He created us for a purpose. Life on earth is finite, but life after death is infinite, eternal. Initially, he encourages you to go to the mosque every day for each prayer. You aren't interested. No namaz, no food. He instructs your mom. On coming home each night, he probes her, asks whether you have performed namaz. He tells you he will also wake you before sunrise for the Fajr prayer. One day, your dad brings a pair of headscarves for your sister. She's only eight, says your mom. You don't need to pressure her right away. He, in, uh, excuse me, he counters. Just get her used to them before she, she hits puberty. Your sister refuses to wear the headscarves. She has art classes at school, music, dancing, and painting are taught. She has taken dancing and practices at home behind closed doors. She has begged not to be the word. Favorite thing for art. One of our uh, favorite things on earth is Ghungur, the metallic anklet tied to the feet during dancing. They're expensive. Only in, school, uh, only, only in school practice does she have the privilege of putting them on. She confides in you that she would die to own a pair herself. The passionate stormy thrum of the music intoxicates her. She tells you of wishing to be a classical Kothok dancer. Not in this life, you say, ridiculing the dream that you both know ought to be undreamed. <coughs> Excuse me. So you begin to perform namaz five times a day. You make it a habit. You pray, fast, study, read the Quran, listen to your parents. Soon your names floats from neighbors' mouths as an example to their sons. See how good Sajid is? You laugh overhearing it. Your parents do too. Natasha, the girl of the town, so sweet, so smart, so sought after. Her family lives in a decaying colonial era bijou house overlooking the playground. When you play cricket with the boys in the afternoon, she watches from her balcony. A little later, her music teacher arrives. Soon her voice, pulsing with pump organ, hovers in the air. She sings Tagore. The first time you venture inside her house is to seek about a book on English essays. You forget to blink for a long, lingering moment. Never have you been to a home like this. Shelves, tables, side tables, desks, beds, floors, corridors, everything and anything is choked full of books. Books, books, books. You stand slack jawed. You imagine you have sneaked into a large, creaking, ancient bookshop. The smell is like that of a uh, treasure-laden museum, bittersweet, tantalizing, and transfixing. Do you, do you like reading? Natasha asks you. Do I? Repeat the question to yourself. You don't know, to be honest. You cannot recall if you have ever been told to read anything outside the four walls of the schoolhouse. In your home, books mean a few Islamic titles sitting proudly in the showcase, four of them, Before and After Death, Heaven and Hell, Women in Islam, How to Pray Salat and Biography of the Prophet, and, of course, the Quran, wrapped in its white cloth. 
If you want to read, you can borrow some. Natasha offers. You borrow two books. Short stories of Kajino Jerusalem and Oliver Twist. That night, putting aside your eight great textbooks, you finish half of the collected short stories. Next evening, you are caught in the act. You are in the middle of reading the romantic tale, Jinnar Batsha, the Emperor Genie. What are you reading? Your mom shrieks. After this, you find a way to carry your uh, clandestine reading, half bearing the book under your school text, you go unnoticed. On the third day, I re you return them all. You borrow some more. The freshly discovered world of fiction fascinates you. And the bonus of an after reading discussion with, with Natasha is magical. A few months later, one hot Friday afternoon, you are devouring the three musketeers. There is a knock on the door. You get up to answer. It is Natasha. Uh, I think I should stop here. Uh, thank yeah, you for listening. Yeah, please, please. Me. Because we have to give some time to chair. So now, uh, quickly, I will request Mr. Ramendu Majumdarji, uh, whatever he wants to say, and if he wants to present uh, a short story. So, uh, this, this is all yours, sir. Please, thank you. Ramenduji. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good news for you all is that I'm not going to read anything because I'm not a fiction writer. I write nonfiction anyway, but welcome to this session of uh, fiction uh, writing. And uh, I really admire Shahita Academy and Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature, first of all, for organizing this South Asian online literary conference. It's good that uh, Ajitji, uh, a tremendous uh, person uh, whom we admire, we have been admiring her for a long time for her untiring efforts to make this South Asian uh, Writers and Literatures uh, Foundation effective and meaningful. And she has kept this uh, tradition even in these days of pandemic. I really admire her courage and efforts. It's really uh, very painful that uh, we have little interaction between the South Asian writers. We look for Western writers, we read their translations, but we don't know our neighbors. Even say in case of Bangladesh, we don't know different states of India, Indian writings. So it's very necessary that as we share same problems, same uh, tradition, same history in this region, we must know each other. So uh, I would request, uh, first of all, to continue this and already they have printed uh, some uh, books on South Asian writings. And I would request Ajitji to uh, go ahead with this project. And this uh, translation of South Asian literature should be available, made available. Uh, I, as I am a person of theater, my uh, other uh, life, uh, professionally, I am an advertising person. But my other uh, passion is theater. I've been in theater for a long, long time. I was the worldwide president of International Theater Institute, the largest uh, theater uh, organization of the world. And that took me to different parts of the world. And I have seen the uh, dynamic theater scenes. So I request uh, for Swal in the next uh, conference to add one or two sessions on drama and theater, because yeah. that's a very powerful genre of uh, literature and also cultural activities. Yeah. With these words, I once again pay my homage to uh, Ajit Ji. Uh, please live long with good health and it's really nice to see you after a long time, Odiji. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Ramendra ji, for all your good words. And you have given a very good suggestion that is to be taken care of by Madam Ajit Kaurji for the next <coughs> conference. So now uh, our time limit is almost over. So uh, I, on behalf of Sahit Academy and the Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature, thank all of you participants uh, for participating in this lively session. Namaste and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.